Ah! Greetings, Brethren Cloaking Donkey here, bringing you another beginner's guide for classic Dark Age of Camelot, and this time we're going to look at Albion. Dark Age of Camelot is a class-based MMORPG that doesn't really focus on the more modern interpretation of the Trinity, which is DPS, heal, and tanking, and instead is built around a variety of group roles. If you want to know more about these group roles, do check out my Beginner's Guide Primer that will let you know what all of these different group roles are, how important they are and how they influence group building for both the PvE leveling experience and RVR later on in the game. In general, however, you can say, especially while leveling up, the more of these group roles you have in your group, the better off your group is going to be and the more efficient it is going to run. There are some exceptions to this, but as a broad rule it is definitely a good one to go with. Now there is one thing I didn't cover in the other two beginner's guides, because it is just not quite as relevant for Hibernia and Midgard, and that is Auto-Train. Auto-Train is something that exists in all three realms, but it is only really very prevalent in Albion. Basically at some point it was decided that for some of the classes in the game, it is absolutely vital to have certain abilities, and that without these abilities, these classes simply don't work correctly. And so the auto-training system was implemented. Basically, if you do not put points in these specialization lines that receive benefits from auto-training, then they will be trained for you, with extra points that your character receives on top of the points that you usually have, making you end up with more points than you otherwise could have for your abilities. Usually, while leveling up, most classes get 1, 1.5 or 2 times their level in skill points that they can then spend on various specializations. However, if your character has an auto-train line and you do not invest points into this line at all, you will receive free points every 4 levels starting at level 8. So let's take for example the Armsman in Albion, who receives auto-training in Slash and Thrust. If while leveling up you choose not to put points in Slash and Thrust and instead, for example, put your points in Crush, then you will receive a free skill up in both Slash and Thrust at level 8 and at level 12, level 16, 20, 24 and so on and so forth until level 48, at which point you will have received the maximum number of 12 points. As I said before, these are bonus points, they are entirely on top of your general allotment of skill points. And for each line that receives auto-training, that you run completely with auto-training from level 1 to level 50, you will receive a total of 77 bonus points on top of your basic skill point allotment. If you ever spend a point into this line, however, the process is interrupted and you will no longer receive points, even if you take those points out at a later time, or even right away. As soon as you invest points, that is it. You do not receive any more auto-training benefits in that line. So if you want to do auto-training, you will have to make that decision right away and stick with it for as long as you want to gain those bonus points. On the screen, you can see the classes in Albion that receive auto-training. Some of them, on the other hand, have various builds that only become possible if you do use the auto-training mechanic. The biggest example of this would be the Minstrel. The Minstrel auto-trains in Songs. Songs is where all of the Minstrel's utility comes from, so if you do not spec into Songs, you will have a harder time leveling than you would otherwise. And unless you're getting power leveled by someone or you're with very understanding friends, you will have a very hard time finding groups and it will be even harder for you to solo anything. However, if you do not auto-train, you can go for 50 songs and 43 in either Slash or Thrust. If you do, however, auto-train, you have enough points to go for 44 in Slash and Thrust, which unlocks another weapon style, and for both Slash and Thrust, the level 44 weapon style is actually quite powerful. So you really should think about this beforehand. I think you can probably go without auto-training. Just be aware that this is definitely not the most optimal choice. If you want an optimized character, you have to do auto-training. On Armsman at Mercenary, however, it is incredibly easy to get around the auto-training because only Slash and Thrust receive auto-training at all. So you can just level with Crush instead and then at a later time respect to the other weapon type that you want to use. 
Paladin is a little bit of a special case, because Paladin only receives auto-training in Slash and Chance. Once again, the Slash auto-training can easily be done by leveling with Crush instead. However, Chance is a very problematic thing, because without your Chance, Paladins are pretty much worthless while leveling up. You do far less damage than an armsman, you have less hit points than an armsman. Armsmen are just way, way better than you will ever be if you do not bring your chance. The only thing a paladin is really useful for while leveling up is that endurance song. Luckily, the only specific build that really requires you to go for that chance auto train is a two handed sword paladin, and two handed sword paladins are really not very good anyway. So, for the most part, you're really only giving up a few points in parry, and that really isn't that big of a deal, to be honest. All archer classes in the game get auto training on their bow line, but scout is 100% the single worst class to do this with. If you're not getting auto leveled, you're going to have an incredibly hard time leveling because you're not a tank class, so you don't receive any of the awesome benefits that tank classes get for tanking. And so even though you'll bring a taunt style and you'll bring some points in shield, you're never going to be even close to as efficient as any of the other tank classes, and Albion has an abundance of tanking classes. So once again, unless you're being power leveled or you have a very understanding group of friends, it is going to be incredibly difficult for you to auto train your bowline. All right, and now to the classes. When you first create your character in Albion, you have quite a lot of different choices. You can be a fighter, acolyte, mage, elementalist, disciple and rogue. But each of these class choices will only get you to level 5, at which point you have to choose an advanced class, and that advanced class will last you to level 50 and will really define everything about your character, so you should definitely look at these advanced classes and figure out which one you want to play before you even make your character. Not every race in the game can become every advanced class, even if they can become the basic class. Generally, fighters can become armsman, paladin, mercenary or reaver. Acolytes can become clerics and friars. Mages can become sorcerers and cabalists. Elementalists can become theurgists and wizards. If you start as a disciple, you can only become a necromancer. And rogues can turn into minstrels, scouts and infiltrators. The armsman is the main tank class of Albion. Armsmen can also use two-handed weapons and pole arms and become very, very solid melee damage dealers. Paladins are also very decent shield tanks, and they provide two very important buffs, namely Endurance Regeneration, which only ever exists on one class per realm, and they also provide a Damage Add Chant, which stacks with Damage Add Buffs. And when you have both a Damage Add Chant and a Damage Add Buff, your group will do absurd melee damage, so a Paladin is a great supporter for any melee type group, especially while leveling up. However, the problem with the Paladin is that it is a hybrid tank and it has an incredibly terrible damage table. It also means that the Paladin has no access to the Determination Realm ability and they don't really have any ranged combat abilities, so when Paladins are rooted in RVR, they can't really do very much about that and they just stand around. This kind of makes Paladins useless for competitive 8v8 RVR in the eyes of a lot of Albion players. Personally, I think it's not that big a deal and some groups do make their Paladins work, but I'm not the one making the rules and if everybody kind of agrees that Paladins are bad, then well, I guess that's just how you're gonna have to deal with that and we'll have to do casual RVR instead. Shield Paladins are definitely also a very, very good farming class, however, so having a Paladin, even if it's not going to be your main RVR class, is certainly not a bad thing. The Mercenary is technically a light tank like the Berserker and the Blade Master, but their specialty is that they can wear chain armor, and that really makes them more of a medium tank. You give a Mercenary a shield and they become quite the powerful tank while leveling up. They are of course also the main melee damage dealers of the realm, being dual wielders and are just all around badasses. Reavers are also decent tanks and actually very good melee damage dealers for the fact that they use a shield. It's all their self buffs and magic that comes from them being a hybrid tank that really does make them very very good at dealing damage. Flexible weapons which are whips, chains and flails and that sort of thing are their auto training lines, so while leveling up you're probably going to run with crush instead, but once you do have flexible weapons you become a very very good melee damage dealer because those styles are quite destructive. However, once again, Reaver is a hybrid tank so does not have access to determination, which kind of disqualifies it for competitive RVR. 
if you can however find a nice casual RVR group that's willing to take you with them, you can be an absurdly powerful damage dealer in that group to be sure. But do remember that Albion's main type of group is certainly a more casting oriented group, so all sorts of hybrid tanks just generally have a harder time to get in. The Cleric is both the main healer and the main buffer, just like the Druid in Hibernia. The only real problem with the Cleric is their third line, Smiting. You can call God's lightning from the sky and crush the infidels. However, that just sounds so much cooler than it actually ends up being, because it is probably the weakest single target caster in the entire game. And I would personally advise that you stay away from smiting as much as possible, because it just sadly isn't very good. However, if you do stick to healing and buffing, everyone in Albion is going to love you while leveling up, and you are easily going to get all of those groups. The Friar is the only off-healer class in Albion, and is also a melee hybrid. They wear leather armor and attack with quarter staves. Friars make for a decent solo farm class, but they are just not very good in groups. And you're going to have a very hard time finding groups while leveling up. It takes a rather desperate group indeed to even take a Friar on, sadly. In group RVR, you can have an incredibly hard time finding anyone who wants to take you along. Even a melee group is going to make other choices before they're going to get to you. So most of the time, Friars are kind of denigrated to solo classes. And I gotta be honest, while I absolutely love melee hybrids in Dark Age of Camelot, I just wouldn't recommend this as a first class to anybody, because often you will just be sent away. The Sorcerer is the number one toolbox caster of Albion. They can be a damage caster if spec for body, they can be powerful debuffers and debuff resistances for any wizards or theurgists they have in their group. In their mind line, they become crowd controllers and mana battery and can charm any creature in the lands as their pets. Sorcerers are very, very powerful and most groups while leveling up really want to have a sorcerer for both the crowd control and the mana battery. The Cabalist is the standard pet class of Albion. Unlike the other two pet casters in Midgard and Hibernia, this one sadly can't become a bomb caster in any of its lines. It can still be a pet pull caster and really good as a solo farm character, but if you want to level in a normal, non-pet pulley type group, then your only real benefit is decent single target damage and the ability to off-heal. Cabalists in their body line can drain life from enemies and then give their own life to other players and then obviously heal themselves back up with their life drains. This is a bit fiddly and kind of depends on how high level the monsters are that your group is actually killing. If they're too purple, you're gonna have a very hard time keeping this up. But if it's a smaller group and you're killing mostly oranges or reds, Cabalists can absolutely be an off healer in your group. And they're a damage dealer at the same time. Theurgists are the other toolbox casters in Albion and together with Sorcerers, they are really the reason why the prime group of Albion is a caster group. Theurgists are powerful damage casters who can summon a plethora of limited time pets. These pets are basically targeted casts directly at someone and they will run towards them and punch them until their time is up and they disintegrate. Not only is this very powerful for interrupting, it can actually also do quite a lot of damage. Furthermore, the Theurgist is a great melee supporter because it provides both damage add as a buff and a haste buff. And when specced into Earth, it is also the bubble class of Albion. Theurgists are all around popular, be it leveling up, PvE at the higher levels or RVR. Wizards are the main damage caster class of Albion. Their fire line is Albion's bolt caster line, which generally isn't that amazing, but unlike the other bolt casters in the game, wizards actually get a very, very powerful single target nuke in their fire spec line. And that makes them quite the dangerous single target caster. In their ice line, wizards become bomb casters. Just like the Theurgists, they also have damage add as a buff that they can provide to their allies, but they don't have quite as much utility to offer as some of the other classes, and they're a little bit more specialized in RVR and require a bit more of a setup around them. And whatever you do, stay away from the Earth line, because Earth Wizard might be the single worst caster in the game. And then we have the Necromancer, everyone's favorite little Casper the Dickhead Ghost, who you will certainly learn to hate in your time in Albion, because they will infest all of the spots that you are trying to level at, they will take your mobs and camp every single farm spot in the realm, because that's just what necromancers do, and there's no way of ever pushing them out of a spot by just being faster than them, because they have unlimited mana. What's not to love? 
They are definitely the single best solo farm caster in the entire game, because as mentioned above, when specced into death sight, they never run out of power, because they have a power drain spell that actually regenerates their power. And then they also have a life drain spell, so their pet practically never dies, and it's all hunky-dory. If there's nothing around except necromancers, you can also kind of take them into a group because they become a surrogate mana battery. Their power drain spell also comes with a power transfer spell, so they can heal other people's mana basically and then drain it back up. But just like the Kabbalists off healing capability, that kind of ceases to be a real thing when the monsters are too purple. They can also be relatively decent debuffers for a melee group if you really can't find anything else useful. But the single best thing about necromancers is that they are 100% completely and utterly useless in RVR. They have no application in RVR whatsoever, it's entirely a PvE class. Which is great because all the hate you build up for this class over the time that you play Albion, you can release at level 50 whenever some necromancer asks you for a group. You can say, no necromancer, no. You are not joining this group, because you're useless. Nobody likes you. Shame. Shame. The Minstrel is Albion's speed class, so that makes them very important for RVR. And they're also kind of a mana battery, but generally for mana battery you kind of want a sorcerer instead, because it's just the better mana battery. Minstrels are also melee hybrids, and they can charm pets. All of this together makes them an incredibly powerful solo RVR class, and it also makes them relatively decent at soloing in PvE. But the biggest problem with the Minstrel really is that to be a perfect Minstrel, you kind of have to go for auto-training, and that makes you entirely useless while leveling up. But what are you gonna do? You really do need those minstrels at higher levels for every RVR group. So oftentimes, while leveling up, you kind of just have to accept that the minstrel might be useless. And, and if you have a welfare spot, offer it to a minstrel first. The scout is the archer class of Albion, and arguably, once they are level 50 and doing RVR, they are probably the most powerful archer class there is. However, what makes them so powerful, namely the ability to spec into shield, also makes them entirely useless while leveling up. Because unlike the hunter and the ranger, this cannot really be a damage dealer in a group. So most of the time you're going to be solo leveling and then you're going to do solo RVR later because archers are useless in RVR groups. And if you are a brand new player, you've never played Dark Age of Camelot before, I would absolutely not advise the Scout or the Infiltrator to be your first class. Stay away from these classes as your first experience, because your first experience with the game will just not be very good. It will be incredibly frustrating because, well, most people won't even want to group up with you while leveling up. Pick one of the other classes that are more useful to groups, and if you want to be able to solo, there are still plenty of choices here. And once you've gained some experience with Dark Age of Camelot, you can still come back to the Scout and the Infiltrator at a later time. And that kind of spoils what I'm going to say about the Infiltrator, because it's just as much of a solo class in both RVR and leveling as the Scout. It can be a tiny bit more useful in a group while leveling up, because it's a dual wielder, so it's a decent melee damage dealer. However, everything that makes the Mercenary the awesome class that it is, the Infiltrator doesn't have. So while you can put out maybe about the same damage as the mercenary, you're not a tank. You're a pure damage dealer, you're made of paper, and you don't provide anything at all over the mercenary. So again, not a class I would recommend as your first choice going into Dark Age of Camelot. Alright, and now to the races. As I said earlier, not every race can become every class. So for example, if you want to be f an Inkonu fighter for some strange reason, the only ones you can choose are the Armsman, the Mercenary and the Reaver. You cannot become a Paladin. On the left you will see the best choices for stat distribution. Now let's get a little bit deeper into some of these. The best choice for an armsman is the Highlander. As an armsman, you really want to go in either two-handed swords or pole arm, and let's face it, it's mostly going to be pole arm because it's just the much better line. And as such, you want a bunch of strength, and the Highlander is simply the strongest race in Albion. However, it's not that big of a difference. I mean, it's certainly not as big of a difference as the Fear Bulk in Hibernia or the Troll in Midgard. So a Briton really isn't that far behind a Highlander. In 
I would definitely stay away from Saracen, Avalonian and Inconu, however, because their strength is really rather low, even in comparison to the Briton. Or they waste a lot of their stat points on things you just don't need. For a Paladin, the best choice is actually the Saracen, and this is because as a Paladin, you are going to be a shield tank. Do not go for a two-handed Paladin, they are pretty bad. And as such, Saracen is simply the best choice because it has the highest dexterity, which means your blocking is going to be the best it can be. If you do this, you also want to definitely go for Thrust as your weapon, because you're going to do the most damage. If you go for Slashing, you're going to do far less damage, because you're a Saracen and you're weaker. If you do this, you want to go for 10 Strength, 10 Dexterity, 10 Quickness, mostly because Dexterity for blocking, but also because Thrusting damage is 50% your Strength and 50% your Dexterity. So it's just both blocking and damage, which just makes it so much more important to put points in. Britain and Highlander Paladins are still fine, I suppose, but you definitely don't want to go for Thrusting on a Highlander Paladin. Now with Mercenary there are two choices, Highlander if you want to go for a crushing or slashing mercenary and Saracen if you want to go for a piercing mercenary. For a Highlander you want to go with 10 strength and 10 quickness and for the Saracen because dexterity also increases your piercing damage you want to go 10 strength, dexterity and quickness. Now for the Reaver it's an interesting choice because the flexible weapons are also 50% strength and dexterity so once again the Saracen because of the use of shields becomes the best choice. The other two are both eh, I would really go with the Saracen. For both Cleric and Freya, Britain is the single best choice stat-wise, because they have the highest dexterity and dexterity is incredibly important for casting speed on the Cleric, and while the Freya can't be anything other than a Briton anyway, so... However, there is something to be said about not being a Briton Cleric, because I don't think there is a single race class combination that is more obvious than the Briton Cleric. Britain just isn't that good for any other class that isn't a caster. So when you have a Briton with a shield, that's most likely going to be the group's cleric. So you know, being a Highlander could actually mean that they're a little bit confused for a little while and could give you some time to actually get out some heals, instead of the Briton cleric which is immediately going to be targeted. And obviously for the cleric you want to go with 15 dexterity, 10 piety. Piety is the casting stat for clerics and dexterity as always goes into casting speed which is the single most important thing for any caster. For the Friar, you also want to go 15 decks, but put 10 points into Quickness for the attack speed. Friars use staves, and staff damage is 100% derived from Dexterity, so do not waste points into Strength at all. For both Sorcerer and Cabalist, Saracen is the single best choice. Just like the Lurikeen in Hibernia, the Saracen has such an absurdly high Dexterity that it is just a powerful, powerful caster. Inkonu, however, is not a terrible choice for both Sorcerer and Kabbalist because it comes with 70 Dexterity, which is just 10 less than the Saracen, but also comes with 70 Intelligence. So if you want to do a tiny little bit more damage and want to be much smaller on the battlefield, an Inkonu isn't an awful choice. The other race choices are pretty terrible though. Sadly, Saracens cannot be Theurgists and Wizards and you only have Avalonian and Briton to choose from. Both of them start with 60 dexterity, so it doesn't really matter in that regard, but the Avalonian starts with 80 intelligence. Then again, just like with the Briton Cleric, Avalonians usually are theurgists or wizards, so you're just kind of making yourself a target. When somebody targets you in RVR, they see only your race, so you pretty much couldn't be yelling, hey, I'm a wizard slash theurgist more loudly than by picking an Avalonian. And since both of these do start with 60 dexterity, a Briton really is just fine. The only thing that matters for a Necromancer is Dexterity and Intelligence, and so the Inkonu is actually the best choice because it offers both. Maybe I should have put the Saracen in yellow because it's not that terrible, but I would still go with the Inkonu. And then you can either go 15 dex and 10 int, or 15 int and 10 dex. It really doesn't make that big of a difference. After all, you're still just a silly farm character. And then lastly we have the rogues, and for both the scout and the infiltrator you want to absolutely go with the saracen because of their incredibly high dexterity, specifically for the scout. The infiltrator I suppose he could technically be a Briton. For the minstrel there is a choice between highlander or saracen depending on whether you want to go for thrusting or for slashing. If you want to go for thrust you should pick the saracen and go for 10 strength, 10 dex and 10 quickness and if you go for the highlander you should go for slashing and then your starting allotment should be 10 strength, 10 quickness and 10 charisma. Charisma being the casting stat of all the song classes. 
All right, and that is your beginner's overview for Albion. I really hope that this video was helpful, and if it was, please consider giving it a like, and also consider subscribing to my channel for more gaming, history, and mythology goodness. I've made a bunch of guides on classic Dark Age of Camelot, which you can find either in the cards in the top right, or you can also find links in the description of this video to every single one of these starting guides. But until then, I've been the Cloaking Donkey, and I'll see you in another video!